Welcome back to yet another ground up SCX24 build. And man, psh, looks like we are done. Nope, it's not the case. I've got this out for reference here. So you're looking at my UAF SMP build, otherwise known as Slow Mofo. So this is built around Mofo RC's carbon ugly as F frame rail kit and his brushless outrunner, the orange stubby SMP motor. I also am using MoFRC's reduced uh, brass portal kit, a little more clearance and gear reduction and weight, and I've got a slew of orange accompaniments, some brass links on there, and WT Micro custom resin wheels, and the uh, kicker is the no longer made Atlas 6x6 clear Lexan body that I've got painted up here, so just a super cool build overall. Got the little motor viewing window in the back. And just a lot of cool details to this. Something that I get a lot of compliments on when I take it out. And I've been wanting to replicate this somewhat for a while now. So if anyone is a child of the 80s, they will definitely be familiar with Knight Rider. And if so, Kit and his nemesis car in the show. So that is the inspiration for this build. So luckily, I've got another clear Lexan Unicorn 6x6 body. So that is taken care of. And of course, you know what motor I'm going to have to use. Mofo RC's ROP, or Revenge of Pancake, brushless motor. You can't get any more opposite to the SMP than that. So now all we need is a UAF chassis rail. And for that, I think I'm going to surprise you a bit got something I don't think you've ever seen. We've got the prototype UAF 6x6. So this is just super cool. You get the UAF plus a little more for that third axle. So I think without further delay, let's jump in and take a look at the parts we'll be using and build up my version of car. I want to do a quick comparison here to the typical UAF chassis which I have here in the titanium flamed version, which would have been perfect for that purple motor if I didn't have this 6x6 chassis. So this is in plastic, 3D printed for the prototype. I'm sure this would be in metal or carbon in production, but it looks like to me, other than the third axle setup, it's this portion that's different. It goes to just brace holes Whereas on the typical UAF V2, you have a double shock mount system there. And then it takes the hinge all the way to the back. And of course you get your third axle setup. And overlay is almost the same. There's a little tweak to the plastic shape and that may be due to just printing or strengthening requirements for the print itself, but basically the same profile as you can see. So let's jump into all the parts and pieces we're gonna to need to actually make this a six by six. Okay, obviously we're gonna to need to start off with three axles and I've chosen these nylon portal axles that I've heard really good things about. I have not used these yet. They uh, look pretty realistic with the nice gusset and the C-arm. There is no gear reduction in these and these do have, as you can see, dog bone and cups in there, but you get the full assembly, brass hexes, pins, and uh, gearing in here. So very nice and smooth. Um, so happy with that. And the fronts come with, uh, looks like an Emacs plastic servo tray and billet links. Then in the middle, I've got the pass-through version. You can see there it comes with the pass-through worm gear and of course uh, the hexes and portal boxes. But a uh, nice bit of weight there, um, even though that thing is just all nylon. And then the, the pass-through comes with, of course, a link riser, a plastic one. And I'm sure if you get this in just a rear, you get the link riser as well. But it's nice. You get basically all-inclusive, all the hardware, even brass hexes and pins. So you really need nothing else. And these happen to be from Mofo RC. Me Us sells the pass-through and the front and rear as well. And then I know Maz Design sells front and rear of the nylon setup like this. So... I think any way you go, you're getting basically the same exact product, just rebranded. But uh, anyways, excited to try these out. So instead of moving straight forward with these fully assembled, 
course, we're going to tear them apart, add a few things to these. So I've got some goodies and add-ons. So let's take a look at those. Let's do a quick rundown of some of these add-ons I'm going to be using. So of course, you can see I've got some color here and we're accomplishing that with some trio purple anodized parts. And although I'm not using this anodized axle, I'm going to take that purple diff cover and use it for the build. So in the back, you can see some Maz designs. I'm going to swap in a couple sets of CVDs for the steering axles. And then I've got a black brass Maz Designs portal box kit and uh, knuckles. So I believe he's the only one that makes the black brass kit for these uh, style portals. And then moving down the line, of course, I'm going to have some larger servos. So I've got some, you know, better servo mounts than the Emacs. Hopefully I'll be able to use this billet LGRP trimmer servo mount. I've kind of kicked that down a few builds, haven't been able to find a home. Of course, I've got an aluminum MoFo adjustable mount. Then we're gonna finish out the front axle with some 213 overdrive and then a black brass heavy diff from MoFo RC since I used the raw brass version of that on the other SMP build. I'm gonna stick with that whole kit car theme, the same but different. So. Got a little bit of swap out here to do, get those uh, worm gears greased up, make sure everything is spinning freely, and then we'll see what's next. Back a little update on these axle assemblies. So I've got these pulled apart and reassembled. Ran into a little bit of frustration with the uh, portal boxes. So they have three screws on the ends of those that secure them. There is no flange on these portal boxes for the interface, so it's just flat surfaces mating. So you've gotta be very careful not to over tighten these. I found that if you just snug them up, not even trying to over tighten them, they bind up. So it took basically installing one portal box at a time and then making sure it was free spinning. And then once that was confirmed, installing an opposite side and making sure it was still free spinning. So ultimately that's what you want, but ended up using the brass in the middle axle and on the front, of course, with the brass knuckles and then left nylon on the rear, but you can even see on this mid axle, there's a little gap there at the top. And, you know, I don't know if it's the brass is warped or the plastic's off, but just very touchy. So you want to definitely kind of do this off the truck so you can't spin these axles. Um, the second thing was the CVDs. They went in no problem, but comparing those when I had one axle with dog bones, I didn't see any gain and steering throw. These are CVDs right here, but the dog bones seem to get the same amount of throw and neither one of them were binding at full throw. So I'm not sure if there's much of a gain of the CVDs. It might be a better joint, but ultimately there's still a pin in that connection. So um, you might save your money on the CVDs. I don't know. Um, the last thing is the servo tray. So I've got another MoFo RC aluminum tray for the rear. I used one in the front. Um, I've got this big, flat, heavy diff cover. So that would not interface with the little guy um, servo mount. The little guy has kind of a profile cut out for the stock shaped diff with the kind of the three humps there on the top. So I thought I'd use the little guy on the rear, but I couldn't get the, uh, the two holes that saddle the top of the axle to actually align. So I don't know what the deal was, um, if it was the housing, but the MoFo obviously works. I've got it on the front axle, so I'm gonna use one of those in the rear. And then of course you can see I've got some nice purple NSDRC Limited RS100s for the servos on this thing, which I've used before. The specs are incredible, but of course, mainly using these for the purple. So that's the axles. I'm going to get the uh, rear one complete and we'll move on. More purple progress. As you saw there, I got a nice uh, skid transmission assembly here to match that purple ROP. So with some more trio looking really good there. And then I think my last bit of anodized purple is going to be rounded out with these telescoping trill shocks for the rear and then I'm going to use their stock length 32 millimeters for the front 
Now the short ones just come with one extra spring set. It looks like softs and they're installed with, I think, the firm. Whereas these give you the soft install and you've got the uh, mediums and firms as optionals. And then the last item that we need here for this chassis are some links. So I've got my favorites here from Injura. So these are the solid stainless. So they've got some good weight to them, but the key thing is there's no O-rings to mess with and the uh, rod ends you can thread on and off. So you can thread those out a little to adjust the length a little longer if needed. So got a deadbolt and a JLU we're gonna be working with to combine and get the six by six. Of course, I've got some stock axle kits. We'll probably have to chop to the length we need, but I think that's gonna do it for uh, all the pieces we need in preparation for the mock-up. So let's grab those chassis rails and see what this thing looks like. All right, I am just about ready to start assembly here and I've already gone and hung the four links on the transmission skid. And I always like to go ahead and at least hang the uh, one that corresponds with this lower piece of hardware here on the motor mount. And so you can see there, I've got the stock style uh, button head screw rather than what Trill gives you, the nice deep socket hex head. But I suggest swapping that to a button head so that is uh, just more shallow, but that was still even binding with the uh, aftermarket links because they're more oversized. So another good thing about these rod ends is they're plastic. So I just took an X-Acto and shaved off enough of that to give me nice free movement there. So no more binding. And uh, of course the others don't have that piece of hardware to conflict with them. So no issues there, but easy to check that before you even get started. You know, doing one thing at a time, making sure it's all working well is a good way to assemble something. So I think now I'm ready to start actually bolting together these chassis rails. Okay, back to a little chassis progress. So I've got a nice functional slider here. I'm pretty happy with the initial setup. So as you can see, the wheelbase matches the uh, little shorty here. So we've got the JLU front and the deadbolt rear for this mid. And then I used a JLU rear on the back to stretch this away from this axle, thinking I'm gonna have some fairly large tires comparable to that on this. So I need some space, especially for turning. So you can't get those axles too close together. So I think I'm happy with this. Um, the front with these 32 millimeters, they fully compress and I've got a bar here right over the servo, so they bump stop right before this bar will hit the servo. But it's the exact same setup that I've got going on on this one, as you see, this bar up front. So not a lot of travel from those 32 millimeter shocks. Most of the travel is gonna be from the double barrels in the back. So as this one is set up, it can get all the way down and sit on the axle with the frame rails. So I set this one up just the same, pull this up here, you can see it gets up and again the diff is sticking up above the frame rails and they're sitting on that axle. So that's going to have great travel. You're going to have to limit it just like this with uh, rubber bands. So you can see that's full travel on this one and that's basically where this one is sitting. So I'm going to definitely bring this down and then you can see here if I compress this all the way, that's it. I can't get this axle to compress. I can push it up in here but that's because the rear frame rails are sitting on this third axle. So these shocks are not fully maxed out. So I may end up chopping the frame rail short um, to actually let this angle happen a little more. So if these aren't here, this axle will be able to rotate a little more or the frame wheel. So going uphill, I can keep all four wheels on the ground longer at a steeper angle. So right now you can see this one's lifting off the ground because this can't rotate anymore. So without these hindering that stop point, this axle could keep coming and I could just play with where this limit bar is for the upper links. And that would basically be the stop point. But right now it's those links aren't hitting this stop point. The frame is a stop point, but that's basically the initial geometry there. So you can see I've got some drive shafts out. So I'm not going to even worry about the third axle. It's always a challenge. I'm going to get these two set up first. 
And luckily, I've got kind of a, a cheat sheet here to go by. So this has the same setup, front and rear. So with the transmission flipped, it stretches this JLU front a little bit longer. So you can see on this one, I did not do anything to adjust those drive shafts. They are stock. And that's because there's very little travel in this. But what that does, it gives you maybe like as much as much as visible here on that male, there's about that much in the uh, female shaft. So you can see it's kind of a it's kind of a floppy joint right there. There's not a lot of engagement. Whereas this one, the rear is longer, and so it really engages probably about up to here on this. So it's a lot stronger connection. So that's just a little uh, kind of a weak point there. So typically, what I'll do is take probably a JLU rear and cut it a little bit longer to get more engagement on this little front shaft. But I was looking through just the parts and pieces I already had cut up. And so here is a stock JLU front. So you got the little shorty and then you got your typical. That's what's on the SMP right now. And it's probably stretched to about there. So I had a gladiator rear that I'd cut down prior and a JLU front that I'd cut down a little bit shorter. So I wasn't able to use these on another build, but putting those together, that's full engagement to the end. So right there is basically a solid drive shaft. And if I pull it out a little bit to the length of this one, then I basically get the same drive shaft, but let's see, I think I'm getting quite a bit more engagement quite a bit more there so you can see what's left and then I'll see what's left on this one so not very much at all so I think I'm going to do this and just be able to use these pieces since I wasn't able to use them anywhere else save this for something else and then for the rear it is uh, pretty simple here this axle has quite a bit of travel and this one actually gets shortened when you do this transmission flip so Putting a stock deadbolt up to this one, we can see that I did modify and cut the one that's on the truck and line these up. Not a lot, just a little bit, but maybe like three or four millimeters need to come off of this. And that should allow for the full travel here. So a little bit showing and then basically none. So I think I can set these up pretty easily. And then once those are set up, that will kind of let me look at kind of what the articulation needs for this third axle because this one will be moving, this one will be moving potentially. So there could be quite a bit of disengagement and engagement needed through that travel. So that's always a tricky drive shaft. But I think the first two up front will be easy. So I'm gonna go ahead and get to those. And if I need to cut something, I've got this little K&S pipe cutter that cuts these uh, drive shafts very easily, uh, very neatly and cleanly, uh, doesn't crush them. So good little tool to have on hand if you're going to need to trim some. But with that being said, let's move forward. Okay, got these front drive shafts installed. Of course, nothing in the rear yet. I'm going to leave that for a little later, but I thought since I went ahead and hooked up the steering link and adjusted the servo, it might be a good time to go over the electronics. So I've got my usual suspects, this uh, FuryTech Ultimate here, which has a built-in BEC that's adjustable up to 8.4. So that's what we'll be using to run both of these servos. And then I've got this FlySky GT5 compatible FS2A four channel, little micro receiver. So I've got this soldered together and I've got my uh, rear servo I guess on channel 3 for the Flysky GT5 that is crawl control so the crawl control gives you the ability to kind of pair that rear steering in different ways to the front so right now I've got um, even though I don't have the rear hooked up I've got it turning opposite of the front so that will actually help the steering radius but with that crawl control you can actually toggle between a uh, crab walk front steer only or rear steer only as well. But uh, let's get a little better look of it here. So this front axle, that's up at 8.4, that servo. And I've got it adjusted, so my end points are good. So let's check the binding here, or lack of. Nice, quiet motor.
So that's full throttle on 2S. Got some power and see a little uh, torque twist. But there is no binding. Everything is functioning nice and smooth. Got full lock to lock. No undue pressure on those CVDs. So that's basically what I wanted to check. Get all that set up. Make sure all the front portion is working flawlessly. And now we can focus on this rear suspension geometry in this last drive shaft. So before we get any further, I think to really get a sense of how this is going to articulate and uh, just how it's going to be able to climb, I think I need to get some wheels and tires on here to actually mock it up a little bit further. All right, it's time for wheels and tires. So of course I've got the reference build on the table here. So this build has Power Hobby Mud Boss and WT Micro Island style wheels with a black center face. And then I've got the same full cut or full uncut, I guess, Carl Innovations foam stuffed and all of these. So these are the same width wheels from WT Micro. These are actually called Weld. So they're the same center face as the Island style, but they have a serrated kind of lip on them. So I think that's going to work well with the kit car theme being the same, but a little different. So I've got two sets of those luckily to use. And then of course, foams, I'm going to swap in the Crawler Innovations versus the ones they come with, which are much stiffer and thinner. So these are going to compress, but they're going to push that tire out, you know, as much as they can, I guess, against that rim. So they'll make it nice and stretched for the deep dish rim. And then the only tire that of course could match up to the Power Hobby Mud Boss is the Power Hobby Trail Warrior. So this is the same size, same compound, little different, more all-terrain looking tread, but Again, it's going to be that perfect, the same but different tire. So I'm going to get these guys mounted up and we'll see what they look like on the 6x6. But you can see I've only got 7 on the table. It's because I actually snuck an install in already. Just a little test fit here. So I think these look really good. You can see them here compared to the others. But not a lot of difference, but enough. And then of course... You can see the tread pattern here. These are the Trail Warriors. A little bit different than the Mud Boss. But again, nice and puffy. Get that donut. I like that they uh, push out further than the rim, so they kind of protect the rim a little bit. But uh, I think that's going to work well. So let me get those mounted up on the 6x6, and we'll start taking a look at what our articulation is. Okay, I thought I'd share a few tips as I'm getting these mounted up. So the first off, you can see on the foams, I've got them labeled S and M. So it's a good idea. Of course, Crawler Innovations, they've got different colors and they put a dot here on the M's. I believe the firms have a black dot, but if you forget that down the road and just pull these out of the tire, it's nice to have a quick reference. So I always just mark those with a Sharpie. I do the same on the outside of the tire once I get them mounted up, so like on the inside face of the tire, I may put like an F for front on those or an R for rear, but some reference on the outside to know because once they're mounted up, squeezing them, sometimes it's very hard to tell a soft from a medium foam. The next thing I usually do with every tire that's new is take the foam out and wash it with some Dawn dish soap. So I've got these washed and dried to remove any kind of oils from the process. And that's particularly important with these resin wheels because the way I mount these, I just friction fit them. So these fat foams push out the tire against the rim and really help that friction fit work. So most tires will friction fit up and not slip. I've had a few tires that slip, but these power hobbies really grab these resin wheels. I've had no issues with those slipping at all. So it's a good idea to wash your tires to get any kind of you know oils from production off of there but with those notes i'm going to get these mounted up we'll see what they look like i'm back with a little progress here and man those look good you can see i added in some little enjora scale hubs to round those guys out but man that is just looking killer so i've already started into some articulation kind of testing so i've got it maxed out at its limit here on this battery box 
So you can see that middle axle is just barely touching the ground there. And again, that is due to these frame rails hitting that rear axle. So I've still got more shock to give so we could get more rotation. So I've got my two comparable six by sixes set up here. So this is more of what I'm looking for, this big tunnel underneath those. So the blue one is not maxed out. It can go a little bit higher. The black Vader six by six in the rear is fully maxed out, but you can see that's what I'm going for, keeping those four wheels in the rear on the ground as long as I can on a climb. So definitely got a little Dremel work, I think, ahead of me here to cut those frame rails. So got two options. I can take them both off, take everything apart, clamp them together, cut them as one and sand them, or I can try to do it individually, maybe by just removing that rear axle. But either way I go, I think I've got a little bit of work in front of me. But hopefully we're going to end up with something a little bit closer to this capability in the end. Well, it is just about Dremel time, but I figured I'd give you a nice exploded view. So I decided obviously to disassemble everything. So I've got it all laid out here so I can pop it back together pretty easy. Got my little mini vice grips here so I can clamp these together. And I should be able to make a really nice uh, cut on the back there and sand that smooth. You do not want to use clippers on anything that's kind of resin printed. And I believe this is it's not fully resin, but it's a it's kind of a resin hybrid plastic. But if you try to snip it with flush cutters, you'll snap it. You can just break it. So I think you want to kind of use a cutoff wheel and sand it smooth. So that's going to be my process, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, Humpty Dumpty is back together again, and it's looking a little different than uh, when I took it apart. So let me walk you through kind of what I did here. So obviously, as you saw in the photo, I chopped the rear frame rails. So nice and short. So I was putting it back together as it was, and even with these cut short, I was having a, a little bit of binding. So you can see I actually spaced the upper and lower link apart further the upper was mounted here, so this pulled it back and up. So that actually gives me more up travel without those binding. Of course, now it's not coming anywhere close to hitting, but that is due to, of course, the spare tire being new. And this is a spare uh, mount from the Vader kit from MoFo, and it just happened to work in these combo of existing holes, and it also got the tire sitting up straight. You can see the mount actually angles so it just worked out well right there and it just clears this middle diff coming up in the frame. So it can't really scoot up and live any further forward. And so where that was actually limited how much rotation I could get um, out of the chassis here. So I ended up venting this rear spare to make it very pliable, but you can see it does get into the servo here but it shouldn't be a problem because this tire like i say is really pliable so i ended up overall backing down the uh, travel so i moved the shock i believe um, down and forward so you can see the original hole i think was the the furthest up there at the top maybe um, so i played with some different arrangements here but ultimately it looks like my dropout is about the same on uh, these wheels maybe the rear is a little lower so the only other thing i could do to get more rotation because i'm limited here is adjust this shock back maybe to get more vertical drop but that would of course limit how far i can go up because it would bump stop before it hits the frame so there's always a little bit of trade-off but i think now um, the big question is where do we stand versus the other two six by sixes and what we had so of course, this was originally, I think, the max right here. So this is what we were getting. So I'm going to go grab the other two and then we'll compare and see how far we get now. A little bit of deja vu. So it's time to see the new articulation angle here. And wow, look at that. We are now hanging with the two big boys. We've got the tunnel underneath 
and we are just barely touching the ground with this third axle. So like I said earlier, the only way to get more rotation now because of the spare tire servo conflict would be to adjust this uh, middle axle shock to be able to get a little more drop out. But for now, that's going to be our limit. But I think limit is probably not the right word because that is pretty impressive right there. So very happy with that. So now that the articulation is all set, I think my focus is going to turn to this third drive shaft here and figuring out the cuts I'm going to need or see if I can make that out of multiple pieces of uh, some metal drive shafts I have. But one way or another, we're going to get that third axle spinning. So that's next on the docket. Okay, I think I've got these drive shafts figured out. Obviously not installed and tested yet, but you can see I've got all my plastic spares over here, all my metal spares that I had on hand over here, and then a new Gladiator set and a new regular set, just to make sure I had enough to pull from. I was missing uh, a few over here, so this is what I came up with. So basically this is the, in plastic, this is the length at resting um, that the rear axles need between them. And then at the max kind of extensions between those axles, this was dropping out. And right now this has a, a standard kind of rear shaft in there. So that was disengaging and dropping out at full extension. So, you know, usually I would say, oh, well, let's just use a longer inner. The problem is there's a stop built into these. So you can't get full engagement. So right there using that gladiator rear, it's actually too long. So that's the problem. And even cutting down these longer rears, I've done that before and I've encountered like two of them ever that haven't had a stop and the rest of them seem to have a stop. So knowing that I'm looking to my metal set and I didn't have a JLU rear in metal. But I had several deadbolt rears in metal, so I chopped one down. That's the first time I've cut one of the metal drive shafts. Just did that with a Dremel and a cutoff wheel. And uh, came out super smooth, really nice uh, engagement, no burrs or anything. So no problem cutting the metal down. So I actually cut it a little bit shorter than a JLU rear because that Gladiator has kind of a built-in stop to it but you can see they're basically even at resting and then when this guy goes to full extension quite a bit more engagement before it it falls out you know versus this guy so that should work hopefully but obviously it is not installed and tested but that's the theory so i'm going to pop this in and see what we get here okay third drive shaft is installed and you can see I did have to take just a little more length off of it after I initially test fit it. There was a little binding throughout the range of motion and you can see that's how close it gets. So I did, you know, definitely have to take a little more out to get that close. But uh, full extension for this uh, third axle, plenty of engagement. And then this is actually the longest bit of extension, that all the way up. The third axle all the way down, I've still got engagement there. So that's why you need that longer inner. But it's just a, it's just a game here of getting these guys to slide past and uh, get as close as they need, but also spread as far as they need. So that all works well and I'm happy with that kind of range of motion there. What I didn't consider in mocking all of this up was the extreme angle that this drive shaft can get versus the links. And I also didn't have this spare tire mount on there. So in playing with this, I noticed I've got a big problem here. So let's get this axle all the way up. You can see how close it is to that spare tire mount. Start to bring the third axle up and there's the collision. So I'm nowhere near full compression on those rear shocks. So let's see, get that all the way compressed to bring this up. And there's kind of a bump stop. So that would definitely drop that middle axle off the frame. But right now, the third axle hangs lower. So if I adjust these shocks back, that'll lower this diff, lower the drive shaft, and it'll actually drop that axle in the middle a little bit lower. So that may 
in turn keep my angle the same because it'll actually keep that axle a little bit lower. So it's going to be some combination probably of playing with the shock mount positions on the front and rear. I may adjust that third axle as well just to give me a little more kind of breathing room up against this tire. As you can see that's that's full compression right here, these guys. It just really, I mean, you're rotating all the way up into that frame there. So anyways, I think there's a little more adjustment, but overall, I think the, uh, the hard part, the drive shaft is solved. So now I've just got to get all my clearances working. Take three, time to see the final outcome here after this little tweak. And there we are. We are back to exactly what we had on that forward climb. So both rear tires are on the ground with just a slight adjustment to those upper shock mount points. So the middle axle, I believe I moved that shock mount back, looks like three positions there. So that allowed the middle axle to drop further but not get up into the frame as much. And then this shock mount position, I moved back one and that basically stops that axle from rotating as much. So you can see there that servo is just barely tagging that spare tire. So a much better condition there overall. So I'm going to set this down and we'll take a closer look at the drive shaft clearance. Quick look at the new stance here. And man, this thing, look at that. It's just nuts. Let's square it up here. Um, overall, sitting a little bit higher in the back, but I think a little more even front to back because the skid, I believe, is supposed to have a, a rake to it and it does versus I think we had it more flattened out with the back lower. But uh, overall, I think it looks really good. I can always limit it with some rubber bands to pull this down if needed. But uh, we basically took this geometry and lowered it so we get the same kind of, you know, insane action here. But uh, no, no hangups with the drive shaft. So let's see if we can see that through here. Got the servo cord kind of in the way. But if I compress this middle axle up, you can see we're nowhere near resting on the frame like we were. That diff is a lot lower. You can kind of see the drive shaft through there. So that's stopping well short of hitting that mount. It's even kind of below, kind of midway to the bottom of that frame. So well below the mount. So that works out just perfectly. So it's almost like nothing was changed and this clearance with the tire got much better. So maybe we should retest it now, get a link on here and get actually three axles and two servos working. Well, I know I said I was gonna hook up the rear end and do a quick test, but I figured since I've already got both servos in and the battery tray modified for the body, that didn't leave too much. So I figured might as well get the electronics installed and then we'll do a demo here in a second. But before I get into the electronics, the mail arrived. So I wanna go over what I got because I'm gonna be using it on the build here. So one of the things I got was these brass weights for the uh, nylon portal axle boxes. So you can see they have that odd shape of the portal box. They just friction fit and slide right on. So I ordered three of these. And the main reason I ordered these was for this middle axle here. So I've already got one installed and you can see it there. I'll pull this spare off, flip this, but you can see without the knuckle, it can slide all the way back to the uh, back edge of that portal box. I believe on the knuckle version, it probably can't slide that far back. It would live further in the wheel, but you can see it's pretty tight to the rim right there. And part of the reason that I went with these other than just needing the weight there was the fact that you could just dremel and chamfer the edge or just sand some off if there was some clearance issues there but like i say with this middle axle no issues with the install and the reason i really needed it was to help keep that axle down because i ended up putting in a limiter strap to kind of pull the chassis down to keep the ride height a little bit lower but what that was doing was keeping the axle from dropping out and you can see there i'm still limited just a hair maybe like three millimeters a full dropout but these guys i believe are 22 grams a piece whereas the full brass kit that i've got spread around the front two axles and that's including the knuckles 
I believe that total is like 41 grams or 45 grams. So these add quite a bit more weight just right there at the wheel. And that's definitely needed because these rims are like four grams a piece since they're resin printed. So that is that. And then the other item is this handy new uh, multi-pack of spacers that Injora has come out with. So this is my second order of these so far. And I used to use Hot Racing, but you can't really find them anymore. And I've actually already used these on the build. I don't think I mentioned them, but I use them as shock spacers. I think I used a real skinny one here to space the frame out just a hair, like maybe another millimeter and a half, just to make sure I had a little bit better clearance with this plastic frame since it's flexible. But uh, highly recommend having some spacers on hand if you're doing builds. Another nice little product I've got recently, some nice little organization boxes from CowRC. As you can see, I've got a bunch of spacers in here of different sizes. So these boxes are super handy as well because they house these kind of strips of four in here and they each have an individual lid. So that's super nice. You can just open one and dump them out or fish in there so you're not going to spill everything. Keep it nice and organized. So I highly recommend these uh, little guys from CowRC. They also make a double capacity, I guess. And I've got all my kind of screw hardware separated in this one. So it makes it super quick and easy to uh, pull what you need for builds. But anyways, enough of the, uh, the mail time commercial break here. Let's get this back on here and let's take a look at the electronics. So the first thing I had to do obviously was get the side trays installed. So I went with MoFo RC's metal trays. I used those on the other build. Had to do a quick mod to the outer edge. And for the front link mount screw. But other than that, um, perfect little guys to fit on there. And you can see they ride with a bias shifted towards the back. So plenty of room uh, for the front tire to clear here. I'm going to have to screw this spare on eventually. But since it fell off, I'll just show you the uh, routing through here. So initially I had this double sided to the frame. Um, but test fitting that other body on there, it looked like it was kind of hitting it. So I pulled the double side off, but I think I'm going to find some other way to kind of keep that nice and neat through there. And then just some double side for uh, this guy on the back for the ultimate. And then as always, the Rock Wolf Designs little styrene mount for this little mini receiver. So that's double sided down and then just coiled the wires nice and neat there, nice and low, plenty of room for the battery here. So we'll get that hooked up here in a second with the battery and we'll do a little demo. But I think that is uh, coming out pretty clean right there. Looks really nice and we don't have too much more to go. So let me get a battery out and we'll test this guy. All right, first things first, let's do a little uh, overdrive test here. So I've got the tires taped. Let get this guy turned on. I think I've got that centered up here. Let's take a look. Check out this ROP creep. So I do have a 3S battery in there right now. So quite a bit of overdrive and then of course the rear are spinning together. Looks like uh, everything is functioning so let me get it off this box, untape it and uh, do a little tabletop test. 
All right, it's time for a quick tabletop test here. We'll do a little creep up. Man, that motor is quiet and smooth. Let's see what this articulation looks like. Look at that. This doesn't get any better. Everything's touching right there. Nice. Very smooth climb. Creep it down. See if we can keep all the tire. Uh, we're floating that middle axle a little bit right there. Not bad though. Take it more of an angle this time. Something a little more challenging. I don't know if challenging is the right word, but something that will articulate a little bit better. And look at that steering. It's <laughs> just such a nice slow crawl. Such nice control. Well, I think the verdict's in. I think everything works as intended. It's fully functional. And so we're just lacking the one major component here, which is, of course, the body. Speaking of bodies, you know I had to do a quick mock-up here since we've got one basically ready to go here. So although it's the wrong color, I think you get the general idea here. And man, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely, definitely feeling this thing. Just super sick. Let's see here. Oh, plenty of clearance there, just like the other one for that full lock. That is going to be awesome once I get a body painted up. So in fitting this on here and looking at kind of the hinge position and getting the body to sit about the same position on the frame um, to allow, you know, full lock to lock turn here. So it sits back, gives a lot of approach angle here with the nose being so tucked, which is just awesome. So the main difference I saw was kind of this little hump here at the shock tower. So that's a, change on the v2 chassis so if you look here those shock towers are just flat so that allows the body to hinge open easily whereas this setup on the v2 may hinder that or i may have to do it a little different either cutting these hinge notches deeper so the body can fold back or actually maybe trimming the frame some of these humps off to get a little clearance to actually hinge that back but uh there's going to be a little bit of fitment work, I think. It's not going to be as easy as I thought to replicate. Of course, the nose will be up just a little higher. I think I'm going to be able to replicate the same exact magnet mounts that are on this guy. So that should not be hard to do. But uh, a little bit more work to go than I thought. I've got lighting. I've got some uh, parts I forgot to order. So I've got a few things in the mail. So I think this may be the end here for stage one but i think i'm pretty happy overall uh, with the progress here got a full functional chassis um, no complaints with this prototype uaf 6x6 my only note to uh, nick would be maybe to chop off the rear rail um, i don't think anybody is going to mount a bumper back there i don't think anybody would have a hinge point back there Potentially, um, I guess if he makes these in carbon, eventually you can just cut those off with a Dremel. But if he makes them in titanium, you could cut that as well, I guess. But that's, you know, a little different story getting into metal, depending on the finish or whatnot. But uh, overall, I got to say, I'm very happy hoping uh, he does produce this chassis because I think, you know, it's uh, probably the best option out there for a 6x6 
uh, roller that you can build on. I think uh, Mias has a chassis for 6x6s, and I think that's basically it, um, other than some kind of 3D printed custom, you know, just performance chassis. But as far as something you can build and put a body on, I'm not too sure there's many on the market. So this would be a nice little addition, I think. But uh, anyways, I wanna say thanks for coming along on the journey here, at least for the first part. Definitely stay tuned for the body work, um, paint work, all the finishing goodies. So I definitely got some surprises to come. Also wanted to give a big shout out to Nick at Mofo RC for providing me this sweet prototype UAF 6x6 chassis to experiment with. So thank you, Nick. Uh, it was a lot of fun uh, thus far on the build. And uh, I look forward to you hopefully putting this guy on the market. So to everyone else watching, I want to say thanks for coming along on the build journey. I hope you learned something. I always do, especially on 6x6s. They're always uh, fun. Um, but anyways, I guess until next time, thanks for watching.